Well, we're looking at the fifth Sunday of Easter, which it seems amazing that we've already had that much Easter. I feel like Lent is always so much longer than Easter. I know it's not, but it certainly feels that way. And I need to skip straight to the gospel today. We may get to some other readings, but let's start with John 14. This was today's gospel at Mass, and this was really just where my heart was when I was focused, <laughs> focused during my holy hour, which was, of course, not most of the time, but some of the time I was paying attention to Jesus. And this is this is where I was, right? So John 14, verses 1 through 12. Um, and particularly, I was thinking of verse 3, if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. Now, I don't know if any of y'all were into Christian music in the 90s, but there was, I think, a Rich Mullins song. I wouldn't swear to it. I'm never great at that kind of thing. Uh, where he's saying, if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back again. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come back again. You know I am the way, the truth, the life. Keep my commands, and where I am, there you may also be. And the chorus was, then where I am, there you may also be. Up where the truth. <laughs> this is Izzy. Izzy says hello. The truth was said. <laughs> she, she likes singing, I guess. Up where the truth, the truth will set you free. In the world you will have trouble, but I leave you my peace. And where I am, there you may also be. And there's something about that song. May, I mean, I guess there's something about the text particularly, but there's something about the song that just always grabbed me. You know, every time that I would hear that song, if it came on the radio, if we were singing it at mass, uh, I was just like, yeah, right? Like this chorus where Jesus is just looking at you and saying, all I want is that where I am, you would be there too. That's all I want. That's the reason that I'm here. That's the reason I created the universe. It's the reason that I created you. It's the reason that I lived. It's the reason that I died. That where I am there, you may also be. Not where y'all may also be, although I expect that that's what Jesus said in the plural in the Greek. But really, he's speaking to you. Everything he ever has done, ever, in the history of ever, is so that he could be with you. And just to hear that sung again and again. In the world you will have trouble, but I leave you my peace. That where I am, there you may also be. So, you know, John's Last Supper discourses are incredible. Incredible in, in so many different ways. Um, but, you know, here we are in John 14. And he starts with, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, he just said to Peter, you're about to die, right? He, they know this is the Last Supper. They know this is a big deal. They know that people want him dead. He says that he's going to be betrayed. And then Judas leaves. He says that Peter's going to deny him. That no matter what, no matter how hard Peter tries, he's going to deny him. And then he says, but, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. And there's something so striking about that line where he says everything's going to be terrible, but don't let your heart be troubled. You know, I spent the day um, with some children who had just, poor things, a really disappointing day. We were supposed to go to the pool. It took like 35 minutes to get there. We got there and there was a waiting list and then we waited in this lobby for 45 minutes and then we didn't have time anymore to go to the pool so we didn't even get to go. And they were so discouraged. And I was just thinking about all these different saints who, that's the story of their life, right? They had this one thing that they really desperately wanted and God was like, yeah, no. And what made them saints was saying, all right, plan B, plan C, plan D. I'm on like plan L at this point. I don't even know. But Jesus says to us, do not let your hearts be troubled, right? This, this terrible thing is going to happen to me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. This terrible thing is going to happen to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You're going to be fired for your faith. Do not let your heart be troubled. Your husband's going to leave you. Do not let your heart be troubled. You're going to struggle with infertility. Do not let your heart be troubled. You're going to feel abandoned, betrayed, rejected, ridiculed, ignored, unloved. Do not let your heart be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. And the fact that he's saying this as he's about to go to the cross, knowing, you know, John doesn't share his struggle in the agony in the garden, but we did see a glimpse of it uh, the chapter before, right? I am troubled now. He says, I am troubled now. Then he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am troubled now. Jesus says, this, this is not like, oh, never have bad feelings. This is choose joy. 
Choose hope. Choose trust. Do not let your heart be troubled. Your heart may be troubled. Don't let it happen. You may really be struggling. You may really be suffering. Cling to the cross. The cross stands as the world turns. Choose to be Mary Magdalene kneeling at that empty tomb. Do not let your heart be troubled. Or maybe, maybe we need to say, don't let the trouble of your heart shake the determination of your soul to cling to Christ. And he says, look, the reason I'm leaving you is so that I can bring you to me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If there were not what I have told you, that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. Here's the thing. Everything that troubles your heart is in the divine providence of God. It might be an awful thing. It might be something that God does not desire at all. But in God's providence, he allows it so that he can bring you to himself. Your chronic illness is so that he can prepare a place for you. So that he can take you to himself. Your loveless marriage, your lack of marriage, your your past, your shame, all of the ugliness. God says, I am working in this so that I can bring you to myself because ultimately at the end, that's what matters, right? All of the troubles of this world are going to be as nothing compared with the joy of being with him so that where I am, there you also may be. And he says, where I am going, you know the way. And God loved Thomas. Thomas has some really good moments. My Lord and my God, let us also go to die with him. Thomas also has some tough moments. He says, we don't know where you're going. Jesus is like, I said I'm going to my father. I said I'm going to die and rise from the dead. Like, Thomas is like, we don't, we don't get it, right? Like those things make sense to Christians now, but they didn't make sense to them because they couldn't even see when Jesus was speaking plainly because it was, it was too foreign. This concept of the father, this concept of resurrection. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. You don't need to know the perfect path of righteousness to follow. You don't need to know all of the novenas to pray. You don't need to know all of the boxes to check. You don't need to know all of the ways to pray. You don't need to know your temperament and the way that prayer works. Into These things are helpful, but what matters is to know the way. The way is Jesus Christ. He's the way to heaven. There's no like 12 step, read this book. You know, those books can be helpful. 12 step programs can be great. Jesus is the way. And it does not matter how many hoops you jump through and how many steps you follow if you don't know him. If you don't know the way, none of those paths are going to make any sense. None of them are going to do anything. If you know me, you will also know my father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says, Master, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Now, Philip gets a little bit of a rebuke here, right? Like, have I been with you for so long a time and you still don't know me, Philip? But I think we would do well to seek to emulate Philip. Show us the Father and that will be enough for us. That, that's a text for meditation right there. Lord, show me the Father and that will be enough. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas, when the Lord appeared to him towards the end of his life and he says, you have written well of me, Thomas. What do you desire of me? Thomas said, only yourself, Lord. Philip says, all I want is you. I don't want to be preserved from suffering. I don't want this great job. I don't want this person to fall in love with me. I don't want clarity. I don't want peace. I just want the Father. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of the Father's only Son. Because Jesus says here, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So when we look at him in the Eucharist, when we see Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in a sense, we're looking on the Father because the Father is in him and he is in the Father. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe because of the works themselves. We have the testimony of the miracles from 2,000 years ago, but we also have testimony of miracles today. Incredible things that are happening in the world by the intercession of different saints, by the intercession of the Blessed Mother, but through the power of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
That's what makes these things happen. Believe because of the works. Believe because of my word. But believe. And he says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these. Because I am going to the Father. And that's that's what's handed on to us. And that's what we've been reading in the book of Acts for the whole Easter season is these works that are being done by Peter, right? I mean, Peter couldn't walk on water when Jesus was holding him by the neck. And Peter's raising the dead. Left, right, and center. Right? He's making the lame walk, the blind see. Peter, who had hardly faith for anything. Because, Jesus said, I am going to the Father. And when I am there at the right hand of God, I will do whatever it takes to bring you to me. That's the purpose of miracles. Miracles happen not because God's like, ooh, you, you don't deserve cancer. You don't deserve to stay dead. You don't deserve to be blind. Miracles happen because God says, I want you with me. And if the way that that's going to happen is by raising that man from the dead or restoring sight to your eyes, I will do it. And if the way that's going to happen is by allowing you to stay in your suffering and your loneliness and your depression and your anguish, it will break my heart, but I will do it. Because God loves us too much to take away all suffering. You know, those who think that a lack of suffering is a sign of God's favor haven't read the gospel because the only one who ever lived in the fullness of God's favor by his own merits, right? Mary lived in the fullness of God's favor by the merits of the son. Jesus Christ is the only one who ever lived in the fullness of God's favor by his own merits. And look what he suffered because God was too eager to have you with him to even spare his own son. And in that chorus, that where I am, there you may also be. That, that's what was driving Christ on his path to Calvary. It's to be with you. That where I am, there you may also be. Thinking of your face. And, you know, I've been reading Consoling the Heart of Jesus by Father Michael Gately and praying a lot about this concept of, you know, that we can bring joy to the heart of Christ, even while he's walking to Calvary, even while he's hanging on the cross. I was telling my nephew about this on his first communion retreat that we had last week, that when you go to Mass and you're looking at Jesus and you're saying, Jesus, I love you, or when you're in adoration, you're looking at Jesus, even when you're tired and you're bored and you don't want to be there, but you stay because you're choosing to love him, that consoles the heart of Christ 2,000 years ago. Just as he could carry the weight of all of the world's sins for all time, he could also feel the joy of all of the world's love for all time. And so as he's walking that way to Calvary, that Via Dolorosa, and he's saying that where I am, there you may also be. There Mary may also be. There Angela may also be. Their Michael may also be, their Scott may also be, their Dawn may also be, their Paige may also be, their Christopher may also be. Looking at you, looking at your heart, seeing you, loving you, wanting you. And when we go to him, especially before the Blessed Sacrament, but any time that we lift our hearts to him and say, Lord, I want to love you. Lord, I want to bring joy to your heart. Lord, I want to console you. Jesus, I trust in you. What that does is it's a response to his prayer. His prayer that where I am, there you may also be. You, says, Lord, you say, Lord, that, that's my desire too. Bring me home to you. Show us the Father and that will be enough for us because all we want is that where you are, there we also may be.